guess I'm going to start by thanking you all for for joining us. Uh, we are about a week and a half away from COP28, uh, which is uh, the next climate conference uh, happening in a region full of major fossil fuel exporters uh, and indeed hosted by a major fossil fuel uh, exporter, the UAE, uh, which makes it sort of the perfect time to discuss methane. Um, both in the context of the UK's own North Sea Basin and indeed uh, globally. So to help us uh, navigate our way through the uh, challenges and questions we, we will be discussing uh, about methane today, I'm joined by three absolutely excellent panelists, which I'll briefly introduce. The first is uh, Claire Wang, who is Senior Advisor to John Kerry, the US Special Presidential Envoy for Climate. She has a background working for American environmental NGOs and is an expert in this area. We also have Mats Rongved, uh, a petroleum engineer by training, but one who's focused on carbon capture and geothermal energy rather than just extracting uh, hydrocarbons. And you might think of him as uh, the just transition in a, a single individual. He's now working for Bologna, an environmental uh, NGO. There's Mats joining us up there. And our third uh, panelist is Rebecca Tremaine, who played a key role in the UK's COP26 team and helped steward the UK into joining the Global Methane Pledge. Uh, she now heads up UK government affairs uh, at the uh, Clean Air Task Force. So I'm not going to speak for very long, but I want to give you all a bit of an intro to methane. Uh, so I'm going to start with the basics. What, what is methane? Well, most of you, certainly if you're joining us from the UK, uh, will know it as natural gas. It's the main constituent, uh, and it is often found mixed up in oil reservoirs and coal seams as well. And, and leaks from these make up about a third of the anthropogenic emissions of methane that we see in the world. Of course, methane doesn't just come from fossil fuels. It's also produced by uh, agriculture, notably cows and sheep, but also rice paddies. And those together, agriculture makes up about 40% of all of the methane emissions across the world. Uh, and it also comes from landfills. Um, so the uh, when biodegradable waste goes into landfill, it uh, is it breaks down um, anaerobically, and that emits about 20% of the methane emissions that arise from uh, human factors. So you might be wondering, well, why does this matter? What's, what's the big deal? And the big deal is that uh, methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. Over the span of 100 years, it's about 30 times stronger than CO2. Uh, but over the very short term, over 20 years, it's over 80 times um, better at warming the climate than CO2. As those figures will, will make you think, this is a short-lived greenhouse gas. It is actually destroyed by the atmosphere over time. And so if you end methane emissions, its temperature effect disappears. And so it's kind of unlike CO2, which for the purposes of sort of our lifetimes and our children's lifetimes is effectively permanent. All the CO2 that you put into the atmosphere basically stays there. Methane is removed. And that means that it's really interesting as a greenhouse gas. So because it's so strong, but so short lived, it's responsible for about half a degree of warming so far. And that's in the context of a of a global climate goal of only a degree and a half of warming. So it's actually really quite a big deal. And we know that urgent action to reduce methane emissions could have a, a small but rapid and potentially very significant relative cooling effect over the course of this century. Uh, it's important to say that that cooling effect is pointless if society is not also cutting CO2. So there's no sensible way in which you should trade faster methane reductions for slower CO2 emissions reductions. But if we can cut both methane and CO2 quickly, then some of the tipping points that you will perhaps have read about uh, that are possibly going to happen this century, like the collapse of the North Atlantic subpolar gyre or the collapse of the Greenland ice sheet and a few other sort of rather scary things, we might be able to avoid those. Uh, and so rapid methane emissions cuts are an incredibly important part of what we need to do to keep the planet in a relatively happy and livable state. Um, but I don't want to talk too far on this. I hope that's a helpful introduction for you all. Uh, I'm going to kick off by inviting Claire Wang to uh, to start us off uh, and perhaps to answer the question of where the Global Methane Pledge has got up to in the past two years. Uh, and perhaps you can explain a bit about the rationale and the numbers. So, you know, keen uh, listeners and viewers will know that the IEA said that uh, it's technically possible to cut methane emissions by three quarters from the energy sector by 2030. So, you know, why is the Global Methane Pledge only, only targeting 30%? Uh, I'll leave you to answer that and to answer, uh, uh, to give our listeners and viewers a bit more of information about the Global Methane Pledge. Thank you, Claire. Great. Thank you so much, Dustin. Can you guys hear me okay? 
Yep, loud and clear. Perfect. I um, was having some tech issues earlier, but I am very glad that those have been resolved. Thank you so much to Green Alliance for organizing this event today, um, just on the cusp of COP28. And of course, thank you everybody for joining this very important conversation. Uh, Dustin gave a very uh, helpful overview in terms of the scientific imperative for us to cut methane emissions from all sources around the world by the end of this decade as a critical way to keep warming to 1.5 C and avoid crossing dangerous tipping points. Uh, because of the scientific imperative and because while methane contributes uh, either one third or half of warming, depending on how you calculate it today, but receives far less than half of global attention. Uh, two years ago at COP26 in Glasgow, the US and EU launched the Global Methane Pledge, which is a collective commitment to reduce anthropogenic methane emissions by at least 30% by 2030 from 2020 levels. Uh, this particular figure, um, Dustin, as you noted, is born out of the uh, global methane assessment from UNEP and the Climate and Clean Air Coalition that finds that technically feasible and readily available solutions can cut methane emissions across sectors to this level by the end of the decade, uh, which of course is aligned with a 1.5 C trajectory to cut overall methane emissions uh, in line with 1.5. Um, today, I'm very glad to say that over 150 countries have joined the Global Methane Pledge, covering over half of global methane emissions. And in the short seven years of 2030, we now have to accelerate implementation of methane reduction projects and policies, first to stop the record year-on-year -year growth of methane emissions, where today's trajectories will put us online for a 13% increase in methane by 2030, when we, of course, need to be decreasing that. So first, we must bend the curve to flatten out the growth of methane emissions and then see deep and rapid reductions. Of all of the solutions that we see across the methane uh, sectors, the oil and gas sector must play the leading role in achieving the fastest and deepest reductions, because this sector has the greatest share of cost-effective and technically feasible methane mitigation potential. And as Dustin noted, COP28 being hosted by one of the world's largest oil and gas producers is a critical moment for other producers and consumers to step up with actions to reduce methane emissions from their fossil energy production and consumption. As Dustin noted as well, the IEA estimates that over 75% of methane emissions in the oil and gas sector can be abated with, it, with existing technology, and nearly half of emissions can be abated at no net cost. To put that into context in terms of the benefits uh, to global climate, if we achieve the full methane mitigation potential in the oil and gas sector, that would have the same climate benefit as immediately zeroing out the emissions of every car and every truck in the world. Um, it's the equivalent of a 10th degree uh, Celsius in warming by mid-century, which is incredibly substantial when we're talking about avoiding overshoot of 1.5 C. Um, of course, this has to happen in the context of a global decarbonization of the energy sector. But one very important thing to note is that even in 1.5 C aligned pathways for oil and gas demand reduction, if we do not see that accompanied by specific targeted immediate actions to reduce the methane intensity of residual production, we actually will not reduce methane emissions quickly enough or deeply enough to overall reduce greenhouse gases in line with 1.5 C. So that means that there is no climate substitute for immediate actions to cut methane from oil and gas. We will not be able to deliver our climate goals if we do not do that, even if we see full success in the energy sector. Of course, I just want to note that it's important for the oil and gas sector, not just to cut their methane emissions, but to address their overall scope one, scope two emissions, putting aside the very obvious question of scope three actions. Um, to put it into context as well, scope one and two emissions from the oil and gas sector account for 15 percent of all energy sector greenhouse gas emissions. So that would be the third largest emitter in the world, even before you're taking into account emissions from the consumption of oil and gas, which is a clear opportunity for the sector to cut those emissions. And IEA estimates that those emissions can be cut in half by 2030, again, as a critical complement to the energy transition to give us time to limit warming to 1.5 C. Importantly, cutting methane from the oil and gas sector is not just a climate solution, it's also an immediate energy security solution that can prevent the need for additional exploration of gas elsewhere by simply capturing the nearly 260 billion cubic meters of gas that are wasted every year in the oil and gas sector from flaring, venting, and leakage. Um, if this gas were captured, it'd be the third largest gas producer in the world. So again, a clear intersection of a pragmatic climate solution that also improves energy access and energy security in the near term.
Um, for all of those reasons, accelerating national action and mobilizing new resources for methane reduction, particularly for developing countries, is a core priority of U.S. climate diplomacy, and particularly to uh, inspire fast action on the fossil energy sector is a priority for us with this upcoming COP. Um, one, there, there are two things that I want to flag for your attention to track as we head into the next two weeks of COP. The first is the methane finance sprint, which President Biden launched at the Major Economies Forum this April, challenging countries and philanthropies to deliver at least $200 million in new grant-based funding for methane reduction across sectors by COP28. This is critical because even though methane is the second largest contributor to warming, uh, methane finance only accounts for 2% of overall climate finance, as was found in a report from the Climate Policy Initiative last year. So clearly, we need to align global climate finance flows to take into account the outsized importance of methane reduction. And uh, keep your eye on the space because we are on track to uh, over-deliver the methane finance sprint uh, and potentially uh, over-double the amount of grant funding available for methane reduction in developing countries from last year's levels. A second area that you should keep your eye on is the space of national action in fossil energy methane. Last year, President Biden launched the Global Methane Pledge Energy Pathway to accelerate methane reductions from the fossil energy sector. Since then, and since the launch of the Global Methane Pledge, we have seen major implementation progress in this area and hopefully more to come. Of course, folks probably tracked very recently the EU finalizing their methane regulations, covering not just domestically produced fossil fuels, but also establishing a methane standard for imports, which is going to be very helpful in cutting methane emissions overseas, particularly among the highest emitting exporters to the EU. Additionally, the US, Canada, and Australia are all in the process of finalizing strengthened regulations to cut methane emissions from our oil and gas sectors. And we're seeing a lot of action as well from developing country contexts. So for example, last year, Colombia and Nigeria became the first countries in South America and Africa respectively to develop methane regulations in this sector. And we expect additional major commitments from countries uh, coming up this COP. Um, one other thing I want to note is that we are working very closely with our other partners, including uh, the UN Environment Program, World Bank, and others to accelerate resources available for methane mitigation in the oil and gas sector. One particularly interesting program is the MARS program through the International Methane Emissions Observatory. So MARS, or the Methane Alert and Response System, which is a great acronym that I love, um, is going to speed up the attribution, detection attribution, and then mitigation of satellite detected super emitter events in the oil and gas sector. It launched in a pilot phase at COP27 last year and is already issuing detections and supporting emissions reductions. One area that I definitely want to highlight is progress with China on methane emissions. China, of course, being the largest emitter of methane in the world. Um, as you all probably tracked last week, the US and China put out a Sunnyland statement after uh, long negotiations that I was lucky to be a part of in California. As part of that announcement, uh, China uh, committed to include all greenhouse gases in its next NDC. Uh, to put that into context, uh, China's non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions alone would be the largest, third largest emitter in the world before India, and uh, currently are omitted entirely from its NDC, from its 2030 target, and from its 2060 target. So this is an enormous move for China as the world's largest greenhouse gas emitter to address these critical greenhouse gases, including methane. And of course, China also released its methane action plan a couple of weeks ago as well, following on the US-China Joint Glasgow Declaration. Uh, which is uh, exciting progress to see uh, and would hope to see additional actions by China to incorporate those uh, more qualitative targets um, and goals into actual quantitative targets and policy standards moving forward. Um, a couple of words on our domestic action and then I'll turn it back over to Dustin. Uh, we are mobilizing resources across the U.S. government to address methane emissions abroad. That includes technical assistance from EPA and DOE, our Pipelines and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration to help on downstream methane mitigation in the oil and gas sector, as well as our State Energy Resources Bureau. And our investment agencies are also very eager to support development and investment in methane reduction projects overseas, including through our Exim Bank, our U.S. Trade and Development Agency, and our Development Finance Corporation. We are, of course, also taking very significant steps to cut methane emissions in our own oil and gas sector including through the finalization of the EPA oil and gas methane regulations, 
the issuance of a new pipeline uh, methane rule that is expected to achieve up to a 58% reduction in methane emissions from pipeline leaks and blowdowns by 2030, the mobilization of billions of dollars in grant-based funding to repair methane leaks, uh, implement uh, methane reductions across the oil and gas sector and to plug orphaned wells in the oil and gas sector, and of course, through the Inflation Reduction Act's new waste emissions charge, which is the US, uh, the United States' first ever fee on a greenhouse gas that starts at $900 a ton of methane in 2025 and rises to $1,500 a ton in 2027 and beyond. Um, so that was a very fast run through of the whole suite of actions we are taking domestically and internationally on methane uh, and happy to turn it back to you for any questions. Thanks very much, Claire. That was a, a tour de force, I think it's fair to say. Uh, you've covered the entirety of the world and China and the United States in some detail. So I think we are going to come back to you for uh, for questions. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm going to go straight to Mats Rongfeld. Uh, and I just to build the link here, um, you've just heard Claire talk about how the United States is proposing to uh, tax methane at between $900 and $1,500. But those of you who are in the know about Norway knows that it has a methane tax, which is roughly equivalent to £45,000 per tonne of CO2 equivalent. Uh, so a pretty staggeringly um, you know, expensive uh, tax. Now, other listeners will know that um, Norway, of course, banned routine methane flaring and venting in 1971. So Matt, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about the history of how this came about, perhaps what enabled Norway to have this globally leading position on methane leaks, um, just, to, just to kick us off. Thanks. Hey, um, yeah, thank you for uh, for that introduction, and I'll try to to, to come in on that on the methane uh, tax and also the flaring um, the flaring ban. So, but first, my name is Matt Strongvid, and thanks for having me. I work for the the Norwegian environmental NGO called Blona, where I normally work with uh, with CCS and hydrogen, but the natural part of that is methane. And as Dustin said, I, I guess I believe I was invited into this. Uh, discussion to kind of bring the Norwegian uh, history uh, into this debate. So on the on the reported numbers, Norway has some of the lowest methane emissions uh, related to the oil and gas production. And my angle into this was trying to, okay, I can bring a little bit of the historic perspective and see if we can put some light on how we got to these uh, low emissions. And, and maybe more importantly, what are kind of the lessons learned uh, that can be transferred to countries like the UK or elsewhere in the world. Um, but I'll, I'll start a little bit with the history uh, to, uh, of this. So Norway found oil in the ninth, late 1960s. And as a poor country then, uh, the government asked uh, a committee to how can we manage this resource for the greater good? And this committee came up with 10 recommendations. Um, they had later been called the 10 oil commandments. Um, but the fourth one, I believe, was it should not hurt the environment. But at that time, uh, global warming or greenhouse gases was not part of it. But the fifth point was we shall not waste any uh, natural gas. It was kind of that uh, poor country economical sense mentality that we should not waste any resources that directly led to the flaring ban. So the flaring ban came already in 1971, at the very start of the, the oil production. So every company producing or wanted to produce in Norway, oil and gas, uh, had to account for uh, routine flaring and venting ban. Um, and, and this resulted in, in infrastructure uh, to handle this gas and transport it to the market. So um, which again facilitated for kind of extra uh, emission cuts uh, as there was somewhere to actually transport it and sell it. And um, and further on from this, as Dustin mentioned, we have the tax on methane. The first kind of step of this was in 1991, the greenhouse gases and climate change came onto the agenda. And uh, I think the first of its kind, CO2 tax, uh, specifically for the petroleum sector was added in 1991. And this really targeted um, the gas turbines uh, for, for electricity on the platforms, 
but also the flaring from the combustion uh, and also as CO2 as a side product from the oil and gas production. Um, but methane was actually not included uh, in this tax until the mid 2010s. Um, and by then, Norway, I believe at least, and, and by then the methane emissions in Norway were quite low, but from, from what I've gathered, this still provides incentives to for further reduction. So it's still a really valuable tax and the CO2 tax alone provided a number of actions in emission reductions across the whole petroleum sector. So it's been a really effective tool. So, so that was like the shortest history I could give. Um, but the important thing, I guess, to get out of this is what are the lessons learned? Um, what's transferable to, to other uh, countries that want to cut their emissions? Uh, and while talking to the industry and industry organization, as well as NGOs and the environmental agency here in Norway, um, the first thing that really came up was, well, you need a baseline of credible data. You need regular reporting of, of, of emissions, uh, which means that you need a standardized method of quantifying the methane emissions. And this needs to be publicly available. So this would be the baseline, like credible information on what the emissions actually are. And when this is available to the public, it allows for people like me or you, or even within the company to, to point fingers and say, well, you're best in class, but you're definitely worst in class. And maybe you should do something about your emissions providing some pressures, pressure even without uh, it costing anything. Uh, and on top of this, you can add the tax, which we have done in Norway. And, and even the industry that I talked to has been, been kind of positive, at least, uh, as it provides some kind of flexibility and work to cut the emissions. But those two together are, are at least from a Norwegian perspective, have been quite effectful. Uh, unfortunately, I guess I cannot provide like the answer to or experiences from the flaring ban that can be directly uh, applicable to the UK, as I guess in Norway they planned it from the start, but in the UK you need to retrofit it to existing operations. Um, but uh, there is definitely, uh, so somebody might have the answer to this. But uh, I don't. But what is relevant, which is my last point I, I think that I have time for, is that in the Norwegian kind of pollution law, uh, there is a saying that, or a word, a phrase that is, you should use the best available technique. And this is also including the methane emissions. So if you build something new or you do a major modification, you have to use the best available technique. And this, in effect, means no routine flaring or, or venting. And, and I would also hope that this could apply to other countries who maybe even have this phrase in their, in their law, uh, that if they build something new or do modifications, there should be basically no routine flaring or venting. Um, so I think that was the quick introduction to the Norwegian perspective. I don't know if I stayed on time, but I hope so. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, yes, uh, excellent. And uh, the thing that sticks with me is, um, you know, we, we all know Norway is a Lutheran country and your description of it, uh, of the way in me which methane was tackled sounds to me like there was almost a kind of religious, we shouldn't waste, this is a, this is a mistake, rather than the rather newer kind of climate challenge type, uh, type narrative. Thank you. I'm going to come back to you in uh, in the discussion, and I'm going to hand straight over to Rebecca, uh, who I hope will uh, be able to give us a, a bit of a, an intro into what we might expect uh, in COP28 in Dubai when it comes to regulation for, for oil and, and gas uh, operators. And I just want to say some of you will have seen the recent analysis that the UA has been caught uh, flaring on, I think, almost every single day of the year, despite a 20-year-old uh, pledge to ban flaring. So the question to you, Rebecca, which, of course, you're going to answer for the entire world uh, is how can the COP process ensure actual cuts in methane waste, in methane waste rather? Thank you. Thanks, Dustin. Yeah, I think that's the crucial question, right? How can the COP make sure that people actually deliver on their pledges? Um, so I'm just going to briefly overview 
the elements where the, of the COP process when methane can really be discussed. So you have two um, aspects really as part of the negotiations themselves. So the way this is this usually works is through a decision text that all parties have agreed to. Um, and this is a way to raise awareness of specific issues and show consensus on the need to act. So for example, at COP26, we had a cover decision there that included uh, some language on the need for actions to reduce by 2030 non-carbon dioxide of greenhouse gas emissions, which included methane. So that's a really good way uh, to raise awareness of an issue and show that people are, are going to act on it. And then you also have this other side, which we term sector deals, and these run parallel to the negotiations and they tend to bring together a much smaller set of countries or organisation and industry, for example, who act as first movers. They then set high level ambition and try to take steps towards, for example, uh, something like the Global Methane Pledge. So you tend to have these two things acting in parallel. Um, and this has partially emerged because it's very difficult uh, in some circumstances to get agreement on specific ways uh, to implement climate pledges within the COP process. Um, but I think this is something that the COP is really trying to focus on going forward. This year, we know the one of the negotiations outcome is going to be a high level outcome in response to the global stock take. So this is the five yearly review of progress towards implementation of the Paris Agreement. And as a as an outcome of this, we've seen in the run up to COP that there's a likely to be potential agreement to triple renewable renewable energy capacity globally by 2030. There's likely to be something on energy efficiency and potential on the phase out of unabated fossil fuels. But I haven't seen anything specific likely to come up on methane. That's not to say that uh, it could come up. Uh, at the COP itself, but often these things have been cooked up in a year in advance of, of the COP and have been, well, they already know who's going to sign up to these specific commitments. The UAE, uh, it's fair to say, has made uh, methane a priority for its presidency. I think this is in response to what uh, Dustin was saying about the criticism that he's received uh, for hosting a COP in uh, a petro state, but we think this really provides a good opportunity to hold the oil and gas industry to account. Um, I think, as said in the premise of this webinar, the oil and gas companies are going to be key to their transition. They've got the money, they've got skills, they've got expertise to really handle the issues like methane. So we need to be, be able to bring them uh, to the table, but also to hold them to account to make sure they're actually doing um, what they should be. So COP28 is really an opportunity for both countries and for companies to make meaningful steps towards tackling oil and gas methane emissions. So on the company side, um, the UAE presidency has been working to agree uh, something called the Oil and Gas Decarbonisation Alliance, where we expect the oil and gas sector, um, including national oil companies, to make new commitments as part of this uh, alliance. And they include things like net zero emissions by 2050, near zero emissions of methane, including eliminating of routine flaring, but also investing in energy systems of the future. So not only renewables, but carbon capture and storage and hydrogen, for example. On the countryside, I think Claire gave a really good overview uh, of what we've seen happening. So China, as we know, has released its methane action plan. This tees up regulatory actions in major sectors, and it's also agreed to include all greenhouse gases in its NDC. Canada, again, as Claire said, it's going to release possibly this week new draft regulations on oil and gas. And the EU has just agreed this methane regulation, which includes a ban on routine venting and flaring, and has also committed to establish a methane performance standard for imports. So this is going to have a huge impact um, worldwide given the uh, EU's largest importer of gas. The UAE itself, Dustin, you already said that they have, obviously this Guardian article has just come out um, talking about flaring um, gas virtually daily, but what they are doing is incorporating uh, previous national oil company targets into regulations by the national government. So potentially by putting these regulations uh, into the actual uh, national regulation, that could help to make sure that they are enforced. And then just um, on the UK side, um, I think it's unlikely that we'll see new commitments on methane coming from the UK, but we know that the international pressure, both at the COP uh, and also the movement on things like the EU's regulations, could really help uh, in order to push the UK to do a bit more in the future. And then finally, just a, a bit of a plug from me, because Clean Air Task Force will have a pavilion at COP and we're going to host a number of different events on methane, including on methane finance. And there will be a me methane ministerial uh, at COP for those of you that will be there um, and want to find out a bit more about what's going on.
Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, I'm, I'm going to facilitate a discussion between the, the different panelists we've got. Um, but uh, I want to remind those of you in the audience who are taking questions. Uh, so please do use the Q&A function. Please pop in your questions and we will we will come to those. So uh, my fellow panelists, please, uh, please pop on your cameras. Uh, I'm going to kick things off with a um, what I hope, which sounds like uh, quite an easy question. Uh, Rebecca, thank you much so much for bringing the UK into things. Claire, I can totally understand why you didn't want to single out the UK as uh, what sounds like a bit of a laggard in this process. That's my view, not, not the view of the US government, just to be clear. Um, but given the experience of Norway, which uh, I think by all accounts is doing a great job at, at preventing methane leaks, and given the fact that essentially Norway and the UK share a, a, a basin where we're getting oil and gas, why can't we just, um, you know, ban flaring, venting, methane leakage all around in the North Sea like that? Why can't the UK just jump from being a uh, a bit of a laggard on this issue to uh, to a potential leader? So, uh, Rebecca, if you, if you don't mind, I'm going to put you on the spot as you're the you're the UK focused person on the panel. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm happy to take that. So I think. Um... It's something that both CATF and Green Lights have been advocating for to have more measures on oil and gas, um, particularly within the UK. I think part of the issue with the North Sea is that uh, um, the government fears that a ban would force the oil and gas fields to close earlier than they are planned and that this will have implications on domestic production and also increase imports from other countries that have higher emissions. Um, and then we've also got the operators pushing back because some of the equipment is is old and therefore they don't want to retrofit and some of it's going to be phased out in the coming years. But I think our view is very much that we can't wait for platforms to be decommissioned uh, to reduce methane um, during oil and gas production. And it's really there are some really quite simple steps operators can take to improve their operations and they're very cost effective and they also lower emissions uh, intensities. So I think uh, I'll give a shout out to the Green Alliance um, analysis that's just been published, which uses data from the uh, North Sea Transition Authority and finds that if you could actually bring forward um, the venting and flaring ban to 2025, it would force companies to clean up their act sooner and bring 2.5 times more gas to market than might be lost. So you're actually uh, increasing energy security. This is also something Claire referenced by uh, bringing those regulations forward. So I think uh, that's definitely something that UK should be looking at. Um, as you said, the, the UK has made some good progress in the past, but this has really stalled since 2015. And whilst they put a lot of, um, they did sign up to the Global Methane Pledge, there's a lot more that they need to be doing, um, essentially, uh, to be able to meet the targets that are really expected under that. And we think really that routine venting and flaring ban coming forward from 2020, 2030 to 20, 2025 is a really simple measure that could be done uh, to actually save a lot of energy, uh, a lot of gas being released. Thank you. And Matt and Claire, I mean, Claire, I, I think you will probably have some experience of how the United States has handled, um, you know, the, this question of retrofitting uh, reductions in, in methane emissions from the oil and gas industry. But also, Matt, you're, you're obviously a petroleum engineer by training anyway. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how difficult it is to actually cut methane leaks. And Claire, if you could share some experience from how the United States has navigated this challenge. So yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Matthew, first. You want to go first, Claire? Go for it. Yeah, um, Yeah. so so as I'm trained as a, by education as a petroleum engineer, I, unfortunately, my work experience there is, is zero. Um, but um, I don't know. I think it's about, there are many things you could do to, to cut emissions. And, and I think the tax and, and the reporting issues I highlighted is is a really easy and, and a no-brainer in a way uh, thing to do because it will force uh, emission cuts uh, that are sort of that are easier to do. And as Claire pointed out, it might not even be that um, that costly. Um, and and in regard to kind of the retrofitting, I, I maybe you guys Claire can show shed some light on that, but. Um, well, I think for some some installations, it's definitely possible, and maybe there is. Uh, it's easier to do collectively and kind of share some infrastructure to handle the gas, and somewhere where you actually have maybe gas pipelines, and it's close to that kind of infrastructure, it should be a lot easier. Um, but but uh, from the Norwegian perspective, I guess it's not 
uh, an experience that can be transferred. And maybe there are other places in the world where this has been enforced that actually have more like updated uh, experience on this, I, I think. But I don't have any, uh, yeah. So the, the, the downside of getting it right the first time is you don't have to work out how to uh, to get it right the second time. But Claire, perhaps uh, if the United States didn't get it right the first time, perhaps you can share some uh, some lessons of how it's getting it right now. Yeah, thanks, Dustin. And I um, I shared earlier uh, some of the an overview essentially of the new policy and regulatory steps that we're taking in the United States to address methane from the oil and gas sector. And of course, those are being implemented by the Environmental Protection Agency, not by the State Department in a purely international facing role. Um, but of course, there you know, in addition to that laundry list of new federal actions being taken, there's a lot of leadership that is taking place at the subnational level as well, for example, in Colorado, California, and New Mexico. And that's a really useful part of the U.S. policy process in general, is seeing the innovation taking place at the state level, and then eventually diffusing those best practices to the federal level as well. Um, but if I can actually redirect your question a little bit, um, I know the conversation here has been focused mostly on developed country perspectives, but of course the, the largest emitters of methane from the oil and gas sector and in general really is in a developing country context where these questions of retrofits is, is increasingly uh, and particularly uh, important and challenging. Um, we all know that cutting methane emissions from the oil and gas sector is probably uh, the cheapest, among the cheapest climate solutions the world has in general. There's an enormous share of this production potential that can take place at no net cost. And even these solutions that take place at cost can mostly be done at less than, say, $20 a ton of CO2. The problem is they still require new capital investments. They require changes in operations. They require a lot of capacity building to either track methane, which is not typically part of a company's ordinary operations from a, beyond just a pure safety perspective, and also to implement those required interventions. So all of that means that unless you have um, clear policy and regulatory actions to require those reductions, clear incentives to do that, or you know, clear mandates from an investor perspective, those implementation, uh, that implementation of methane solutions just simply is not going to happen because it's not part of the core mandate or business model of that oil and gas company. And even the solutions that can take place at negative cost generally tend to lose out in terms of their return on investment compared to more conventional uh, opportunities to produce oil and gas. Um, and so that's why I think it's incredibly important as we actually try to achieve solutions to take those barriers very seriously, because uh, even though a, a principled approach on climate would indicate that industry should act on this, which of course is true, if we don't really take steps to address those barriers to capacity and capital, we just won't see the solutions taking place. And so that's, I think, particularly important in developing country contexts where there are legitimate barriers to accessing capital in areas that have higher risk atmospheres, for example, there are a lot of challenges in implementing policy and regulatory steps if governance is weak. And so I think it requires a lot more creativity and a lot more uh, sort of direct considerations of these incentives if we really are going to address emissions in say in Algeria or a Turkmenistan, for example, compared to a Norway, US or UK. That's a wonderful introduction to the real politique of this. Uh, it may be intellectually rational to cut methane emissions, but you've got a bunch of barriers that uh, maybe uh, people aren't thinking about. I want to kind of uh, pick up on something, though, that Mats, you said, uh, you, you mentioned um, blue hydrogen. And uh, I just want to draw out a little bit about the future of the oil and gas industry here, Claire, particularly touching on what you just said about how this has to be something that is investable. And if we're going to capture methane, there has to be a kind of rationale for it. So blue hydrogen has been talked up as a climate solution, but we, we know that methane leaks sort of undermine the climate benefit of anything involving oil and gas. And we also know that hydrogen, if it leaks, is an indirect greenhouse gas, so it prolongs the lifetime of methane in the atmosphere. Uh, I guess the question to you all is, how do we ensure that blue hydrogen is actually a climate solution and not something that ends up backfiring in climate terms? Uh, so Matt, as you introduce the blue hydrogen thing, I'll, I'll ask you and then I'll come to uh, Rebecca and Claire after you. Yeah, so very interesting uh, questions um, and question. Uh, and first of all, yeah, I'm not a policy expert, so the how to actually regulate it, uh, I'm not that sure. but. What I am sure of is that if we are going to use blue hydrogen or, and now they are, I guess, the discussion on abated, um, uh, we need to take into account life cycle emissions. So from we produce the gas that is going to be used until we get kind of the final product, uh, 
it all needs to come into to account. And, and then if you look at the numbers, it's quite obvious that high methane emissions are not really even that high uh, in as a result of kind of the upstream and midstream uh, production uh, kind of tears down the whole uh, uh, thing of blue hydrogen being climate friendly. So I think for all kind of fossil fuel use, I guess there's a separate debate if we how we kind of going to prioritize it, but if it's going to be a part of the of the transition period, at least we need to regulate it, and it needs to be uh, done done for the life cycle emissions. But how to regulate it and how that process is going to be, I think maybe Claire or Rebecca can can answer better than me. So Rebecca, I might ask you on the policy thing, but Claire, if, if I can, you, you will know, and I realize this is a domestic question and, and you work for the international bit of the US government, so apologies, but the uh, Inflation Reduction Act has a huge amount of support for hydrogen across the economy. Can you say something about how the US is trying to avoid this kind of climate backfiring problem as it seeks to integrate uh, hydrogen into its energy supply? Yes, definitely. And why don't I say a few words first about the, the first question you asked in terms of um, aligning uh, future hydrogen production or honestly ongoing hydrogen production with the climate imperatives. I think this um, shows two priorities that are also really important for our current efforts to cut methane from the oil and gas sector. First, um, we have a lot of problems with pipeline leaks today with methane. Hydrogen is our lightest uh, lightest molecule, so uh, re remedying leaks of hydrogen is going to be even more challenging. So that just goes to show the importance of making sure that our existing pipeline transportation distribution infrastructure is as leak tight as possible, um, particularly as we prepare for more hydrogen ready applications. The second is, again, going back to the point I made earlier about cutting emissions from scope one and two emissions, or, sorry, scope one and two emissions from oil and gas production. Obviously, the hydrogen piece only really addresses the emissions from consumption of a fossil fuel. But if the production of the gas is being used for hydrogen continues to have significant methane and CO2 emissions, that still leaves an enormous chunk of emissions on the table. Again, the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world just from the production without even factoring in consumption. So that's pretty substantial in terms of the amount of cleanup that we need to see to ensure that the overall life cycle of hydrogen is as clean as possible. Um, so obviously the, the steps that we are taking in the domestic side to uh, clean up our oil and gas production, as well as our transmission and distribution infrastructure are all steps that will support um, hydrogen uh, being a cleaner solution. And there's also a host of other programs that uh, I can't even keep track of that are coming through the OE in particular to implement um, the, the new innovation in this space to ensure that hydrogen production, not just blue hydrogen, but also green hydrogen and every other color uh, takes place in as climate beneficial of a way as possible. And in particular, recognizing the role of that and other difficult to decarbonize sectors as well. Thanks, Claire. And Rebecca, I've just been looking at the uh, the questions the audience have put to us, and I think there is a, uh, a helpfully related question uh, from Duncan McLaren, who talks about the dynamic between this fossil fuel phase out kind of campaigns and, and methane emissions control. And the question is, how do we maximize the climate benefit and minimize the life extension of oil and gas production? I think the the question of blue hydrogen is perhaps central to this. So your thoughts drawing on perhaps Clean Air Task Force work in both the United States and, and perhaps Europe. Yeah, of course. I think um, that's a really good question and one that applies across a number of different things, I think, including on carbon capture and storage. I think on the methane side, this is um, we're thinking very much about how to prevent the emissions from uh, existing oil and gas operations. So it's very much about how can you reduce the emissions that they're uh, that they are currently producing. And I think, again, it's helpful to reference uh, the research that Green Alliance did here, because if you look at the North Sea, um, there are 14 sites at the moment that are operating, but they're not really producing much oil and gas, but they are accounting for a third of all flaring and two thirds of all venting. So they're all due to close by the end of 2030. But really, if you could just get them to close uh, sooner, um, you would reduce quite a significant amount of the methane emissions. There are some sites that are going to operate beyond 2030, and those ones um, will basically they're going to continue to produce and, and the government is is not currently obviously taking uh, the government is going in the opposite direction of granting new oil and gas licenses so it's very much about making sure that those things that are in existence are as least polluting as possible um hopefully that covers 
some of that question. I don't, others will probably have views on that as well. Yeah, I mean, certainly the way we've uh, built up the analysis, so there are some super emitters that are producing tiny for amounts of oil, and it's probably just not worth it. So in that sense, people who want to phase out oil and gas quickly and people who want to cut methane emissions are 100% aligned. But Matt, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to put this back to you, because of course, um, you know, Norway is a, is a good performer on methane, but we know that oil and gas scope three emissions, even if we got scope one and two to zero, and I thought Claire's point about how important scope one and two is, was really, really well made. But even if we get a properly kind of zero production emissions oil and gas sector, we can't burn the stuff because we've got a climate to look after. How is Norway handling this uh, this challenge of oil phase out in the context of, of being, as you said before, oil and gas, a poor country and now being one of the wealthiest countries in the world? So uh, I guess that's kind of uh, not a good one for Norway in many senses, because uh, we we have a government now that says we shouldn't uh, face it, not face out, but face down in a way. Uh, and we're not going to put a fear, um, a clear deadline for the oil and gas industry, which is kind of um, difficult to manage. But uh, but so uh, in a way, I guess the what the Norwegian government in a way is is taking as an as an angle here is, is controlled emissions within the country and not taking responsibility for for its usage. Um, but we do uh, have a much, much, much larger, we export a lot more. I think we're the seventh biggest exporter of CO2 if you look at the, at the, what, what it actually ends up being when you, when you burn it. Um, so, so Norway don't re, uh, doesn't really have, as far as I'm aware of, any ambitions on, on that. But uh, what they do try to do is is to go. Uh, one of their uh, ambitions is on carbon capture and storage and provide uh, kind of the CO two storage for the European continent, which of course can, if it's done correctly, maybe provide um, uh, some some. Uh, solutions uh, to that problem. But uh, it's also dependent on a lot of factors. I'm not sure if that answered the question, but. Well, I, I think in a sense, it's, it's helpful to draw that uh, Norway isn't perfect. Um, we, you know, both the Norwegian government and the British government are, are formally committed to, I guess, maximizing oil recovery. And although CCS could be part of the solution, there are big questions, as you say, about the, uh, the, the practicalities. I want to bring out another question uh, from uh, an audience member, Jonathan Stern, uh, who asked about, uh, you know, it's been two years since the Global Methane Pledge was signed. Uh, what's actually happened to emissions reductions? And I, I think, long question, good one, but I'm going to summarize slightly that... Um, Working out what's actually happening requires transparent data. And I wonder whether, Claire, uh, Rebecca, you might be able to draw out what the Global Methane Pledge is doing to ensure that actual that there's real transparency on what's actually going on with methane emissions. Because we can kind of sign as many agreements as we want, but uh, the atmosphere only cares about the total stock of emissions that are getting into it. So, Claire, if I can invite you to start, and then, Rebecca, I'll, I'll come to you. Yes, definitely. This is a topic that we are very enthusiastic about. Um, I'll have to rein in my enthusiasm to keep within the time limit. But so yes, you're absolutely right that um, accurate methane emissions data is critical, um, especially given that it is not as easily tracked as CO2. It can emerge from so many different so uh, point sources or um, diffuse sources. And also there's a question of uh, tracking the difference between anthropogenic and natural methane emissions. So in terms of global methane concentrations, it's a pretty well mixed gas. So tracking what's happening to global methane emissions is fairly straightforward to do with scientific processes that I'm not as um, aware of. But it's the question of actually tracking national methane emissions, uh, improving national methane emissions inventories, improving uh, reporting of that to the UNFCCC, uh, and moving towards more um, granular and uh, you know empirical estimates of methane emissions rather than just relying on emissions factors that is so critical here. And countries are on vastly different parts of the learning curve when we're talking about this. Um, and it's really no small task, but that's the reason why we really are focusing attention on capacity building for these methane emissions inventories in parallel with strength and national policies um, 
that can be put in place even before perfect data is in reach. And that's something that our partner in the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, who serves as the Secretariat for the Global Methane Pledge, is really focusing on with their member countries. We're also focusing on that in our other efforts to integrate um, and improve uh, general greenhouse gas inventories in the, in the UNFCCC. Um, and also that's why it's so important to have methane included in all NDCs, because that is a core component of, you know, the global transparency mechanism to see progress towards emissions reductions. Um, one other area that I imagine that you uh, were interested in is the uh, growing use of remote sensing data for methane, which has been incredibly helpful in bringing transparency to where methane emissions are coming from. Um, there are um, a lot of really exciting opportunities here, especially as more satellites get launched. And as the integration of the satellite community proceeds, and IMEO, which I referenced before, is playing a very important role in that. Um, but I, I won't claim to say that it's perfect yet, especially because there's a lot of work to be done to reconcile different satellite methodologies for detection, to make sure those approaches are harmonized, to make sure that there's actually comprehensive coverage of satellite uh, detections around the world balancing the difference between the point source detectors and the more global diffuse uh, detectors as well. Um, and also um, it's uh, attributing that amount of information to a specific point source to facilitate mitigation. So I think this is definitely an evolving ecosystem. I do think that additional policy steps to ensure that data is globally available and transparently available is very important. Uh, to develop essentially standards and better practices for how to align these different detection methods and on the ground measurement methods to provide more actionable data for mitigation, especially in the oil and gas sector, um, as well as to apply the, those lessons learned, which I think are most advanced from the oil and gas sector to other sources like ag and waste will be incredibly useful so that we can all learn together. And I think in particular between uh, the oil and gas sector and landfill methane emissions is an area we are already seeing very robust interaction and exchange. And Rebecca, I was going to uh, spotlight you on the uh, on the question of remote sensing. Uh, just for, for listeners, when uh, Green Alliance and Clean Air Task Force decided to work together on this, we were really excited by the um, the sort of point source cameras. They've got these very cool methane cameras that you can see methane coming out of uh, onshore oil and gas wells. But I guess the question to you, Rebecca, is where do you see the role of civil society in holding governments to account in cutting methane emissions? And what's the role of these different measurement techniques that we're, uh, we're that are coming on stream? Yeah, it's a great question and one that um, I think about all the time, obviously. Um, so I think the CA CATF has, as you say, used this oil and gas imaging camera. Um, and we've done it in a number of different locations around the world, really, to expose the issue of methane. Because it's one of those things that if you can see that it's happening, I think it basically forces government to take more action. It increases public awareness of what's going on. And so that's one of the things we have been focusing on. I think um, civil society has a great role to play not only in raising awareness, but also um, in what Claire was saying about holding countries actually to account to make sure they're delivering what they said they were doing. I think that question uh, on, yes, it's all very well to have commitments and pledges, but unless we're actually delivering on them, um, what's their value? I think that's where civil society um, has a real role to play in exposing the progress that has been made or where countries are backtracking on the commitments that they've said uh, they will do. Um, and also making those connections across some of the different uh, areas. So obviously the Global Methane Pledge um, will be taken forward by different aspects within government and they don't necessarily always talk to each other. So there's quite a role for us to play sometimes in connecting the dots in governments that have limited capacity to deal on, with these issues. So we've seen that a bit in the UK where obviously agriculture um, sits very separately to what's happening on energy. So it's quite useful for civil society to be able to play a bit of a bridging role there. And uh, there, there's another question, which I think is quite closely linked uh, to this, which is, you know, we're if we're just sort of starting to get to grips with the measurement and verification side of things, um, you know, what does that say about the political ambition or lack thereof to to address methane? I mean, I think across the three of you, you've given an incredibly compelling case for rapid action on methane. And one could argue that... Um, it's easy, in a sense, in the oil and gas industry, because this stuff is pretty cheap. Claire, you said under $20 per tonne of CO2 abated. Uh, methane from landfill, methane from agriculture, big sources, but they're perhaps more difficult. So can I invite you all to wrap up? And I will come uh, in order that you came in. So Claire, Matt, Rebecca, to give your thoughts on the, driving up 
political ambition and indeed what the future might look like as we tackle uh, the perhaps more challenging questions of agricultural and waste related methane. So uh, Claire, over to you. Yeah, thanks for the question. And uh, I really do want to underscore the enormous transformation of awareness and ambition on methane in the past two years alone. It really is a huge step change from people not even realizing the significance of methane for climate action to this groundswell of new NGO, philanthropic, private sector. Ah, Claire, you're you're back. Yeah, you dropped out. Do you want to just wrap up very quickly and I'll, I'll move on? To yes. That. I mean, essentially, I think that the world is taking leaps and bounds to address methane. Uh, I know today's conversation focused primarily on oil and gas, but there is a whole laundry list of transformational activities happening in ag and waste as well. So, uh, you know, stay optimistic, stay focused on this question, because it really is one of our essential climate solutions. I think that may be the last word you get, Claire. I'm so sorry. Matt, the, the question is, how do we build uh, political ambition and leadership on this issue, particularly as we moved um, uh, out of just oil and gas and into agriculture and waste? Um, yeah, so I, I agree with Claire that there's a lot happening. I feel that it's momentum growing and and there's a big focus. I think it's really important for, for new solutions like blue hydrogen and, and, and if we're going to use it for other things. So uh, I think there are many people that are dependent on on this, and and also I think in terms of like the data and the reporting is something we really have to push for to have reliable data. And Norway has done some, I think, and and it's been regulated and it's it's been done for quite a long time. So I think there are in other places as well. So I think there are lessons learned, and I think we just need to move um, and and learn together in, in a way. Thank you. And Rebecca, final word to you. Thank you. I just was going to pick up on what Claire was saying about how I think the Global Methane Pledge has really helped to raise awareness of this in the last few years. And that actually the momentum that that has created will continue, um, I think, to spur action globally. So you, the things like the EU's methane regulation, what the US has been doing on its methane fee, I think the more that countries can learn from what others are doing and see that action is being taken, that should help to drive more ambition uh, on methane globally. Well, thank you all very much. I, I hope we have left you all with a sense that um, we are we are moving, we are acting. The Global Methane Pledge, I think for many people, um, I mean, I should say for, for Claire and Rebecca, it certainly didn't, but for many people, it came out of nowhere and has achieved very rapid engagement and excitement uh, over the last couple of years. Now, I'm hoping very much that COP28 will uh, provide a step change in action, uh, as well as signups and, uh, and interest. Uh, and I want to thank you all for your contributions today. And uh, we're all going to look forward to seeing what happens in COP28. So on that note, thank you all for joining us. Thank you all and goodbye. <laughs>